I understand, Mike, that's the kind of sermon you want to hear. <laughs> anyway, we got there's, there's one more button to push, I guess. The apple pie. The apple pie. Oh, oh, there we go. And I was going to say, uh, Kristen needs a pair of tennis shoes because while she was up here, she could have started the video, but she had to light the candles. And so um, if, yeah, we're having now a, a go fund to get Chris a pair of tennis shoes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good to have you with us. We're going to begin with our, our, our theme song, uh, Land of the Seeking. And, and on Wednesday night, some people were singing. So if you would like to sing along, please do. So let us have that video. We'll uh, start pushing. Stop pointing fingers at other people 
In this confession, we turn our attention toward ourselves and invite God into that honest and vulnerable space. So to do this countercultural thing would be today. Let us pray together using the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Who here has sinned? We have sinned. We put our heads in the sand. We ignore people in need. We make false assumptions and fail to be kind. We are in need of goodness. Good news. Our merciful God. God does not punish, hold grudges, or keep score. When you suffer, God weeps. When you sin, God forgives. When you lose your way, God comes running. Thanks be to God for a love like that. That's your love there. I have you sin. I have sin. I have put my head in the sand. I've ignored people in need. I make false assumptions and fail to be kind. I too am in need of forgiveness. Good news. Our God is a merciful God. God does not punish all grudges or keep the score. When you suffer, God weeps. When you sin, God forgives. When you lose your way, God comes running. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our gathering song, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. <laughs>
Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts, and anoint us with your Spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now our special music from the choir of our praise to you.
As we prepare for our lessons for today, we have the prayer of illumination. And again, uh, you can follow along with us or just close your eyes and, and focus in on what these words are saying to prepare our hearts for the lessons of today. God of good news, there is reading your word, there is hearing your word, and then there is tunneling ourselves into your word, harvesting your word, building a home in your word, laying your word over us like a blanket, wrapping ourselves in your word, knowing your word like the back of our hand, singing your word, planting ourselves in the garden of your word. God, we could listen to scripture like we listen to the news, or we could cocoon ourselves in your word, and it could change us entirely. So bundle us up, give us the ladder, we want to know you. With hopeful hearts we pray. Amen. The reading of the lesson. <clears throat> the first reading is from Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 14. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed to the light becomes visible. For everything that is visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. <laughs> word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And let us welcome the gospel with our gospel acclamation. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. This morning we're going to do something a little different, and as I was approaching this very long reading from the Gospel of John, um, this is something that I have not tried in 39 years of ministry. Yes, that's right, I was ordained at age 10, okay, just let you know that. Um, I wanted to, to take it in sections, and so what we're going to do instead of reading it all and then going back over it, we're going to take each scene by scene. And so this morning let us sing our centering song before the sermon, and then it's all that we want to pray after Jesus. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Jesus got in an argument, a disagreement, 
with not only the Pharisees, but with a number of Jewish people in the temple, on the temple grounds. And they were so angry at Jesus, they were ready to stone him. They were ready to stone Jesus right there on the temple grounds. And as it happened before, Jesus hid himself and walked away. And so our story begins. Remember, this is in Jesus' mind. It just happened. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples come to Jesus and say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? As you can imagine, Jesus, not in the right frame of mind, was trying to calm himself, and he took a breath, and he said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who has sent me while it is day. Night is coming and no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground. He made some mud with saliva and then spread the mud on the man's eyes and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of soil, which means scent. Then the man went and washed and came back able to see. And to see. We know the context. Jesus was walking away from a terrible incident there. And what's he doing? He's walking outside the temple. Already get that picture that this man who was born white is outside the temple. He's not allowed to go in there. Why? Because most people in that day, uh, if you were blind or had some kind of something wrong with you, is it that you sinned? And so that you were not able to go in. So just imagine if you're a cripple, if you can't walk, if you've got leprosy, if you've got you can't see, can't hear, you cannot go to the temple. And so Jesus walks out there and sees this man, who everyone else has said has sinned. Even his disciples said that. That's the question. Who sinned? That's what they want to know. And what's interesting in this first part of the story, if we just stop the story right there, that's a wonderful story. The man, born blind, gets to see. The disciples get a little teachable moment there, and everyone can just walk away. Well, it's interesting that Jesus goes and tells him to wash the pool of Siloam. And that means sent. Please remember who says that, and that's Jesus. Because Jesus calls himself the sent one. Jesus says, I have been sent from the Father. Jesus continually says, I am here because I'm sent. And so Jesus himself basically says that I am sent. And so he tells this man to go wash himself in Jesus himself. Wash yourself in the pool called Jesus. That's what we do at baptism. The sent one. It's interesting because as John writes his gospel here, he uses the word blepo in order to talk about this blind man there. And that means to see, to perceive, to discern. It's physical with spiritual results. Perception and wisdom. And that's what this man gained, and he needed it. End of scene one. Scene two, the neighbor's questions. Now the neighbors and those who had seen this man as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, no, it was someone like him. And the man kept saying, I'm the man. But they kept asking him, how were your eyes open? He answered, well, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said, go to the swamp and wash. And I waited, I washed, and I received my sight. They said to the man, where is he? And he said, I don't know. The neighbors. It's always nice to have kind neighbors, and then it's always kind of a uh, mystery a little bit as to what neighbors really think about me, right? These neighbors are kind of saying, wait a minute, didn't he used to beg out there? And how is it that you see? 
They're perplexed. But you know, the first thing is, is that they, they weren't somewhat to blame. How did this happen? And the other thing that they're doing here is, is that they don't believe him. Were you really born blind or were you just out there begging for money? They feel like they've been taken advantage of. We run into people like that all the time. People that are asking for money. And we wonder to ourselves, are we being taken advantage of? Should I do this? But now they know that he can see now and they're not exactly happy about it. He's been tricking us this whole time, is what they're thinking. That's what they thought. And where is this man? I don't know. I always tell people that if you want to help people that are houseless or unsheltered or people that need help, you have to have a sense of you that sometimes you will be taken advantage of. You just have to have that mindset. Because as much as you give and everything, if you give to someone, there's never that assurance that 100% that that is really going to help the person. You do not know that. So you just have to go in and say, I'm going to be taking advantage of And you have to be okay with that. You really do have to say, okay, I'm going to do this. Maybe 75, 80%, it all works out. I don't know, but I'm going to continue to do that. But see, these neighbors are not in that realm there. They've been taken advantage of. And it's interesting when John uses the word for see here. He says, see him, and it's the arrow. It means to look at, it means to gaze upon, it means to be a spectator. This man was under the gaze of the neighbors. You know what that's like, I'm sure. Gazing neighbors in a very judgmental way. End of scene two. Scene three, Pharisee judgment. They brought to the Pharisees a man who was formerly been blind, and now it was a Sabbath day that Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. Sabbath. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him, How did you receive your sight? He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and then I washed it, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. And others said, but how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So then they said again to the blind man, what do you say about it? It is your eyes he opened. And the man, the man, with this wisdom that he got from Jesus, said, he is a prophet. End of the scene. Suddenly, these questions of people turn to religion and theology. You see, sinners don't do miracles. Which means if you follow that, uh, there have been no miracles on earth since Jesus died. Because what? Well, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the grace of God, right? We're all sinners. And so if you stick with what the Pharisees are saying here is, sinners don't do miracles, then they're just saying there has not been a miracle. Jesus was considered a sinner outside of the law because he healed someone on the Sabbath. That's what the argument was about. But they also just had an argument about what Jesus was saying and doing. That's why they wanted to stone Jesus. He's now considered a sinner. He's now an outcast. He's been driven out of the temple. He's outside of the law. That's what you get when you color outside the lines. That's what you get when you move outside of the box. It's interesting because um, you belong, we belong to a denomination that has been accused of being outside of the box. We belong to a denomination that has been accused of coloring outside the lines. But we're not the only one. There's other denominations that have made some decisions that people don't agree with that took the church outside of the box, outside of the lines, because we're all sinners and we all fall short of the grace of God. And we come before God in grace. And here's this gentleman with that wisdom of just a spectre that says, he is a prophet. End of scene three. Scene four. 
Yes, it goes on. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind, like I said, and that he received his sight. Until they called the parents of the one who had received his sight, and they asked the parents, Is this your son who was born blind? How is it that he can now see? His parents answered, Well, we know that that's our son. That's a nice thing that they say, right? And that he was born blind, but we don't know how he now sees, nor do we know who opened up his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews has already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Now we're back to the non-religious, non-theological questions of the Jewish people. You know, how is it that you can see? Well, let's get the parents in here. So they pull the parents in here, these poor parents. They are afraid. They want to go to the synagogue. They want to go to the temple. They don't want to be on the outside because they know and they see people that are on the outside and they don't want that. And so basically they're taking a step away from even their own son. They step away. He's of age. Ask him as they back up. It's almost as if they say, leave us out of this. We want nothing to do with this. We just want to go home and live our lives and go to synagogue and go to temple. End of scene four. Scene five doesn't stop. They, Pharisees, judge him again. They. So second time, they called the man who'd been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that Jesus is a sinner. And the man answered, with that little bit of knowledge he got from Jesus, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. One thing I do know is I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, well, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And the man, getting frustrated, answered them, I have told you already, and you will not listen. Almost want you to point the finger. But you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? Very sarcastically. Then they reviled against him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we don't even know where he comes from. Man answered, huh, with that little bit of wisdom you got. Well, here's the astonishing thing. You don't know where it comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone who opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man was not from God, he could do nothing. The theologian comes out. They answered him. They answered him. You were born entirely in sins, and you're trying to teach us? <laughs> and they go on. The man, with that little bit of Wisdom that he received when he's got his eyes open becomes a theologian. Out of all that, I love that very sarcastic line when he says, Oh, do you want to become one of his disciples? You can see the steam coming out of the Pharisee's head. Oh my gosh. At that point, they were just ready to say, He blasphemer enters the door for daring to question them. You are a sinner. And they drove him outside of the temple, and he becomes again an outsider. Even though he has his sight back, even though realistically he could go in the temple now because he can't see, they have not put the wall and said, No, you're outside. Unfortunately, that has happened time and time again in Christian churches around. We put up a wall. 
and you say, this is it. You have to believe this, 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 and this, and you have to do this, this, and this, and this, so that you can come up and receive this meal that Jesus has given, that Jesus is the host. There's a wall right there sometimes. And this man had wanted nothing to do with that. He just continues to take that wall down brick by brick. And for that, he's kicked out. End of scene five. Scene six. I'll tell you right now, that's the last scene. So the man's been driven out. Jesus hears that the man had been driven out, and he finds him. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answers, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I can believe in him. Very frustrating. And Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. And Jesus says, I came into the world for judgment. For those who do not see, that they may see. And those who do see may become blind. The Pharisees were not far from what Jesus said this, and they said, uh, Surely we're not blind, are we? As they look like that. And Jesus says, If you were blind, you would not sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. End of the scene. The most important part of this section here, this last scene, is that Jesus finds the man. Jesus seeks him out because he knows what's going on because he just received the same kind of treatment as he was in the temple. He knows exactly where this man is. He knows exactly what's going on in his life and he does not abandon him. This outsider, this prodigal, this cast out, this cast away. Jesus sits down and again tries to comfort him. And that's when the statement of faith comes. That's when this man can see and he can perceive and he has that wisdom and perception that Jesus gave him and he says, I believe. Jesus claims sin to those who are blind or they think that they see better. In other words, we know what we know and nothing that you can do or say will change our minds. We don't know anyone like that, do we? We know what we know, and nothing that you can do or say will change our minds. Wonderful conspiracy theories out there. You see the conspiracy theory in this whole event here? This man should have been enveloped with grace and peace and instead, because of the conspiracy of everything that's happening there, he is condemned. There are better questions that could have been asked instead of who sinned. A couple of those questions would be, how can we heal and help? How can we walk alongside you? How do you feel? So many things we could have done for this poor man who just gets beaten down and beaten down. And his only hope is Jesus. Thank goodness that Jesus finds us and envelops us with love and grace and accepts us just the way we are, even those of us who like to color outside the lines, even those of us who like to jump out of the box every once in a while. Jesus loves us because according to the story, Jesus was an outsider. Jesus was pushed away. Jesus was called a sinner. And the question that this man could have asked, and I love the material we have because it's right in there, the question that this man could have asked is, what are you afraid of? A wonderful question that he could have asked the Pharisees and the Jewish people. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that things might not be the way that they're always are? Or are you afraid that God knows you so deeply, but loves you anyway? Is that too much for you to imagine? It's not. 
Jesus finds us. Jesus loves us just the way we are. Jesus tears down all the walls. Jesus, who's considered a sinner, welcomes everyone so that we can walk out in the world and that we can be welcoming and we can ask the right questions of how can we help you instead of being judgmental and questioning everything. That we can go out in the world with Jesus' love, grace, peace, and we can tell everyone that God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. <laughs> um, our sermon song today again goes along with um, the series that has become with questions.
And this morning, at the end of the prayers there, um, on Wednesday night, we had people that uh, we were having a moment of prayer and they wrote down prayers. And so I'm going to include some of those prayers at the end of our prayers uh, for this morning. But as we continue to be in this time of prayer, uh, let us sing our prayers on the Lord. Listen to your children. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing rain to our thirsty land. You are the balm we need. Prayer for my daughter Linda in her hour of need. I pray that I can keep going the way God wants me to go. I want to keep my home and my family together. Prayers for the Ukraine that the Lord may reach Putin's heart. Prayers for healing and hope. Prayers for better weather. <coughs> Prayers for Pastor Dave. Prayers for the Y and Z generations that so many are lost and do not have Christ in their life. Pray that all who are afflicted with hate may find peace and know that God loves them just the way they are. Prayer for my mom, Pat, who's healing from broken ribs and a punctured spoon. Keep making your guides and help her to a stronger connection. Lord, continue to guide me with your strong hand. Guide my thoughts to trust you and what you have planned. Dear God, I pray that you will open up job opportunities for all those seeking new beginnings. Help us all to have faith in your path that you are leading us 
knowing that you are walking with us. Lord, lead us on your path as you have laid it out for each of us. Help us to follow you and to be your servants as we go on our way. May we reflect your true light to others in their paths. Help us to be strong for each other and always be seeking you. Dear Lord, keep us all safe and healthy. Help me to cherish my husband, daughter, mother, father, and in-laws. Help my daughter as she navigates her teen years and help her learn to communicate well with her friends. Lord, guide me to make good financial decisions and help me to be a good steward of our resources. I look to you, O oh Lord, for strength, determination, and power to finish tasks set before me. And above all, I thank you for providing so much in my life for your steadfast love and an unthinkable sacrifice. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your steadfast love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. And today, Lord of life and of celebration, we also pray for uh, J.R. Lara, who has a birthday this week, continue to shine the light of your uh, path, light of joy upon his pathway. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord of life, we pray for these who need you in a special way that your healing and comfort might be with them. Sandy, Frida, Marion, Larry, Harriet, Marty, Don, Connie, Grace, Baba Joanne, Barbara, Jonna Jan, Lois, Carol, Ernest and June, Doris, the Clayton family, for Amy, Janet and Roberta, Naomi, Dennis, and Jimmy. And those we mentioned in our hearts at this time. <laughs> we continue to pray for these, your special people, Lord, and also for their family members, for their caregivers, for the medical teams that continue to be your healing touch. <laughs> be with them, Lord, all. Merciful God, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation as we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We invite you to stand and to share God's peace as you're comfortable with it. So.
oh gosh, man, so um, As the offering is brought forward, I want to say thank you to all those who were helped yesterday morning um, with our community breakfast series. It was wonderful. So Heather and, and Daniel, and, uh, there was a whole crew of people helping with that. So I, let's give them a hand and say thank you. Um, there was at least um, two couples that I spoke with, but they just said, thank you for doing this. And so it was just very nice. And they said, and, and what about it? And thank you for being such a good part of this community. So I just want to pass that along that people are seeing and noticing our work here. And uh, so we've got uh, sandwich, uh, sandwich making this week and everything. And so we just continue to do that. Uh, another thing I was, is, is uh, uh, a church member has been offering time and talent, I would say, to make this, and I would call it a diagram of this display here, and I hope that you've been noticing it, that every week there's something new up there, and so it helps us on our Lenten journey, and so it's just a wonderful uh, remembrance uh, during this Lenten season to focus in on that, which is important, and that's God's love, and so thank you for that. Um, with that, um, let us pray together our offering prayer. God of good gifts, receive these in all our offerings, as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel, prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence in Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. justice or hungry for a glimpse of the divine. No matter what your soul longs for, there is good here. Friends, this is Christ's table. We are the guest. Jesus is the host. There is a seat here with your name on it. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give God thanks. God of the lost and found, surely it is right for us to give our thanks and praise. Day after day we look for you, and day after day we find you. In the laughter of children, in the sun rising over the horizon, in the flowers of spring. Our seeking does not go unanswered, and for that we are grateful. So first and foremost, we come to you in prayer to say thank you. For when we are seeking beauty, you give us mountains and freckles green eyes and brown eyes. When we're looking for a reason to hope, you give us rainbows after the storm and candles flickering in the window. When we are seeking peace, you give us three-part harmony and the sound of the rain. And when we are seeking justice, your, your life reminds us that everyone is welcome at your table and none shall be turned away. As we seek and are welcome at this table, we remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also for the remembrance of me. For these reminders, we are deeply grateful. And yet, gracious God, our seeking does not stop. For even though your fingerprints are all over the world, we are not yet at your promised day. So in addition to our gratitude, we also pray for conviction. Do not let us get comfortable with half-hearted seeking. Do not let us grow numb to the suffering of this world. Make us relentless in the pursuit of justice relentless in our consoling of the greedy, in welcoming the stranger, and in feeding of the hungry. Like a dog with a scent, may we walk toward your kingdom, never giving up, never wandering off the path. 
as we see and as we seek, pour out your spirit upon these ordinary bread and cup. May this meal be nourishment we need to continue seeking you in this world. Until your promised day, we will pray. Until your promised day, we will seek. And we sing together.
Welcome to all, especially the guests who are here today. We hope that you are blessed by worship today. Please join us in the fireside room after the service for refreshments. There is a Bible study in the boardroom, and you are invited to bring your refreshments with you. You can purchase your tickets today for the Easter brunch in the lobby. We are putting together a church photo directory for the 75th anniversary. We want to include everybody in the directory. You can have your picture taken after worship or next Sunday. Those who are attending the hockey game this afternoon will be meeting at church at 1 o'clock for the 3 p.m. game. The book club will be meeting this Tuesday at 4 p.m. at Rosemary Peterson's house. Choir rehearsal is on Wednesday at 10 a.m. The Seeking Bible Study will be at 11 a.m. in the Fireside Room. The PB and J Group will be putting on Wednesday. Will be meeting on Wednesday at 10 a.m. to make sure to make 50 sack lunches for Opportunity Village and Faith in Action. Please check the list in the lobby for items still needed. The Lenten Soup Suppers are this Wednesday at 5:30 p.m. After the supper, we will have a devotional time based on one of the hymns. We will learn some history and the scriptural basis of the hymn. We will close the night with prayers and communion. This Saturday, we will be taken into the streets and inviting our neighbors to our Holy Week worships. Come and join the group and get your morning walk in. We will meet at 9 a.m. at the church. 
Thank you to the Avengers and Sharon Rigma for the donation of flowers this morning. If you would like to donate flowers, please refer to the flower chart in the lobby. Now is also the time to order Easter lilies to decorate the church for Easter. Please pick up the order form in the lobby. Please take your bulletins home with you to mark your calendars for the other events coming later in the month and in April. Thank you. You did what a wonderful job. I, I really think so. Yes. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, yes, Saturday morning we've got these wonderful uh, full color flyers here. And so at 9 o'clock we're going to um, take them around. And I think that also on Saturday we'll be taking the side lunches down to Opportunity Village. Um, I'm meeting with Jeff, I forgot his last name, but he is now the director. I'm meeting with him on Tuesday and we'll kind of form that up as to the best time to take them down. And so again, thank you for the way that you continue to serve and share. I have to tell you that uh, we received a Google um, review of someone who was worshiping here, and it said that um, uh, the pastor gave me a wonderful welcome. And I went, okay, but also some members gave me a wonderful welcome. And at the end there, it says, if you want to hear God's word preached, and if you want to experience the presence of God, is to come to this church. And I said, there you go. And this is not a member. I did not bribe anyone to do this. And so I have to tell you, this is a, that was a wonderful review. And if you can, review us on Facebook or on Google so that people can know that. And so um, those are all the announcements. And oh, we, we have... Daniel and, and Heather did such a great job yesterday. What I said is there's waffles and, and sausages and leftover. Yeah, so they're not leftovers. No, they're brand new. <laughs> they're they're right overs. They're not leftovers. These are the right stuff. So anyway, so there are they're, they're, they're a breakfast really. Uh, so I just invite you that after after worship. So please stand as we sing our second song and that is on what has now been so. <laughs>